Sure. Good evening. That was intense, huh? I feel like that just, um, sure. It's been a difficult week, two weeks. And that was, that just took me to that place. Thank you for this invitation. Yako, thank you. Um, I'd like to first, you know when you have like a whole plan, I'd like to thank this and protocol observed and um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just need to kind of catch my breath a little bit because I don't think that we can gloss over the magnitude of where we are in our country and how far we've come for the ideal that we thought we would have when we were young activists, when we thought that removing structural inequalities and when we thought legislation would change our realities and to find ourselves in 2019 with name after name after name after name after name of women who are being murdered, lists upon lists upon lists of people we know who are perpetrators of violence, some of whom we kind of had, an, kind of had an idea. And you see this list is growing and the witch hunts and the, some of it true, some of it not, everyone lashing out if you're known to even have had a conversation with a perpetrator, you are complicit. I don't think we can gloss it over. We are hurting in many, 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 many ways, whether you are a native of South Africa or not, we are hurting, we are scared. I shared um, not too long ago that I walked into, I got into a Uber, and after sneaking a picture of his face and number plates and the car and even just a shot of myself. This is what I'm wearing and sent it out to my mom and to my partner just in case because things are happening. I got into the car and um, I noticed two things. One, the guy looked terrified as he was trying to hide his accent. And so we were terrified of each other. And of course we were both relieved when we realized it because then we could giggle and go on with life. And that, that touched on so much of that, um, that I just really needed to acknowledge it and say thank you. And maybe this is the purge that we need and maybe this needed to happen so that we can then really start focusing on what's really going on and maybe move towards doing something about it. Having said all that, good evening, everybody. <laughs> ah, good evening, um, Justice Cameron. It's good to see you. Now that you're retired, hopefully you are taking it easy. Um, congratulations to the Simon and Cody Collective, Norma and Pop. Um, for bringing the exhibition to the university and thank you very much to the Equality Unit and the university and the museum for inviting me to be part of this very historic, very important occasion. And from the minute I got this invitation, I kept thinking to myself, okay, so you having been one of Simon's friends closed at one point, what would he say? And I ask that a lot because he was my mentor and I asked him a lot, about a lot. Um, I was 17 when I met him and I remember just wanting to get his attention and his affection because he was just that guy, you know, he had this air around him. <laughs> I remember the first day of that meeting at Wirtz University when we met for the first time. I was being told by a group of friends that we'd be meeting this activist, this big guy, you know, who's been in prison. Yeah. 
Um, and of course, you know, we, we sat in the hall and we waited and like there were people walking in. I did not peg him to be one of them because he was this small, short little guy who was laughing a lot. My biggest and best memories of Simon was that he laughed. <laughs> Pretty much everything he did, he did with a charm. And I think that's how he kind of succeeded to, to do a lot of what he did was he, he charmed, he laughed, he charmed. So you, you never saw him coming. He was very direct, very clear, very simple in his messaging. I think um, just as Edwin alluded to how he, 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 he would make the biggest speeches and he would have the biggest impact with the most simple ways of saying things. And so at that first meeting, by the time I went to him, he just, he just said, oh, hello. I've never met a lesbian. <laughs> like, oh, so where are you from? <laughs> um, and that was that, you know? This was this guy who was larger than life and so politically conscious and so far ahead of his time that a lot of us were learning. I am a bigoist, and in my 17-year-old self was um, very militant. I can't, people think I am still. Um, <laughs> but he was a Mandela kid through and through, you know? Very much a, while I'm talking, focusing on black issues and black people and black queer people, Simon was a inclusivity, inclusivity. Let's talk to everybody. Everybody is welcome. And of course, we were learning. And in his non-sexism, although he didn't know half the time what and how that manifested itself, just like us, he was also learning. And we, were, we had the sense of community. And I think right now there's a bit of a struggle with that word and with the sense of what does community mean. A friend of mine said, you know when you are from a particular neighborhood, you know where the corner shop is, you know where the spaza is where you can get the loose cigarette because you know you won't get it over there, you know where the church is, you know where, you know, you know where these different areas are for every one of your needs. But as queer people, what does that mean for us? Where is that? for any of us, to a point where when there is something wrong, when there's an ill, when there's a, anything happening, a crisis, we know where to go. Where is that now? So what would Simon say? Simon says, I heard you giggle. <laughs> Simon was that activist, that through and through activist, that old school, each one, teach one kind of activist, that one that had every opportunity, would never miss an opportunity to teach. He'd walk out like, he'd say, Kenya tie, Kenya tie. They must ask, why, why are you a woman wearing a tie? And then you must tell them, you must tell them. And, and we had no fancy words like gender non-conforming, <laughs> you, know, um, <laughs> you know, gender fluid, you know, gender queer. Uh, no, you were gay. You were lesbian, or you were trans, which was also referred to as drag queen, because we had very little of the language that exists now where different people find themselves um, and, and that can express themselves. And Simon, Simon would say, no, then you must tell them, you know, that you are a lesbian. And when they say, what is that, you must tell them. And that, and that was part of the educating. Even when there was really no need to be educating, Simon would be educating. <laughs> And it kind of got a little irritating, if not frightening at times, because like I said, he was charming, and so he would charm. We landed from the US one time, and Simon being an educator, and he was this, the, he would do HIV AIDS workshops, and he would do safer sex parties. A safer sex party at a bar just means screen over there, screen over there, gay porn, condoms. And what that meant is, let's make condoms sexy. Let's make them look sexy. That was education. And then, of course, he'd say, oh, you're wondering? Here's a condom. This is how you use it. He took the opportunity. So in his suitcase, and I didn't know this, he had all kinds of paraphernalia. Uh, paraphernalia. Um, and so we crossed through the, the checkpoint, the passport control. And you know those two lanes, nothing to declare something to declare, something to declare. <laughs> With a suitcase, come, come. 
And now in my head, I know, because I remember we went to some sex shops in San Francisco. What is he going to declare? <laughs> so of course, when he arrives, um, zips get opened, the uh, suitcase is opened, and the security starts going ballistic and saying, because it's like dildos, there's like handcuffs, there's like lube, there's dental dams, things that we were not even talking about in this country at the time. But I'm talking anal balls and sorry, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> All kinds of things. And Simon pulled out each one and asked security, please bring all your friends. This one is a condom, this is how you use it. This one is an anal bead, this is how it works. And they were mortified as I was, but that's who Simon was. He, he, he found ways to educate. By the time we left there, you had people going, ah, okay, got it, bah. <laughs> So you know, now you hear young people saying, it's not my job to ed educate. You know, you're hearing it a lot. I hear it a lot. If, if you are not the one educating about your life, you, it's your life that's in danger. If you are not educating, who's going to do the educating? The people who don't care? The people who are the one doing the, the violence, they care? Who's going to do the educating? And I think taking a leaf from there, and, and a lot of us who are a product of, of Simon's teachings have kind of taken this leaf and continue to want to, to conscientize because you realize that even if the legislation and the law says X, Y, Z, even, even when the policies are there, attitudes are not changing. We understand that structurally apartheid does not exist, but actually we know that it does because the attitudes prevail. They are deeply ingrained, they're systemic, they are inside the fiber of this very university and they manifest themselves through the rape culture because that is a culture of supremacy, the culture of silence, the culture of we do not speak because if we speak, we might just upset the apple cart. It's in, in the fabric of the entire society. So what would Simon say? I ask myself this all the time because I wonder to myself whether he'd be vocal, how would he be vocal? Would he be standing here saying, Stellenbosch University, what are you doing? Would he, is that what he'd be doing? Would, or would he be silent? I, I wonder to myself all the time. So of course I was pleasantly, if not somewhat <laughs> shocked, pleasantly surprised if not shocked to find out that there is a building. It's a building, yes, named after him. Stellenbosch University. I, 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 kept, I asked, I think I remember asking, how? A black gay freedom fighter <laughs> at Stellenbosch University, what is known as the last bastion, you know we call this place the last bastion of, of apartheid and supremacy, ne? how? And of course one wonders and says, okay, so this could either be a step in the right direction or a a farce. And if it is a step in the right direction, how do we then support this? And if it is a farce, what do we do? And I did get the invitation then, and I did not respond. It did not make sense for me to respond because I did not understand Yaku. I, I didn't get it. Also, there was something with the wording, I'm sorry, Norma, I know you were saying, eh, we're not gonna go there. But there was something about it that just said, something's wrong here. And so, of course, a few years later, Norma calls and says, there's an exhibition. And I thought, okay, so maybe there is a direction. And so I am very honored to be here before Simon passed, he would say, you know, we're entering different, difficult times where the enemy is no longer so clear. I think it is. I am sorry. I think it is. Enemy is, is structural, it's systemic, it's deeply entrenched in the fabric of society, institutions, including this one. Enemy cultivates a climate of fear, of powerlessness, the enemy is a capitalist, racist, it's patriarchal, and manifests itself through all the ills that we see in our society. The enemy is clear. 
I think being here and being a part of this is giving me a small hope that there's a beginning of an undoing. It is commendable that this exhibition is here. And in fact, I, I posted not too long ago to someone who was saying all kinds of foul things that, no, come, come and see the exhibition and come and be here. Engage with it. Because my hope is that when students and faculty walk in here and feel Simon's spirit, as, as you all engage with his work and how he personified this idea of being a freedom fighter, of what it is to be an activist in his everyday life and how he approached absolutely everything. One hopes that after knowing him and understanding him that somewhere in this institution something shifts. Because I, I, I do not think that one can walk the, the halls with a name such as this one and, and not be cognizant of who this person is. I wanted to say was, who he is. Because if there is no teaching, if there's no learning, if this is a fuss, how do we deal with that? Simon would pledge his solidarity with the students of this university. Simon would say, Stellies, what are you doing? What's happening? What's going on? Where's this commitment to change? That's what Simon would say, I think, and I believe. So I'm hoping that this sparks something that this sparks this change that we would like to see, where not only are we just attacking each other, but we're able to come across a divide and actually have a conversation about what is going on. One where we are able to be in pain, because this what's happening is painful, but where we can transcend the pain. Because if we cannot transcend the pain and the anger, if we cannot come to a point of, okay, let's talk and reach towards some healing, then we are in trouble. <coughs> And I, I am afraid that I do not want to live in a country where we cannot have at least some measure of hope that we can transcend and start actually having a conversation where those who are victimized are heard and that things start to change without the bloodshed that can possibly happen. That's what Simon leaves for me. And I hope that that's what he does for everyone here. Thank you.